hobbits. Oh, well, you meet them, you know. There's hobbits by nature, and hobbits by stature, and there's hobbits who happen to be both, yeah. <laughs> that was John Ronald Rule Tolkien, author of The Lord of the Rings, a novel whose enduring popularity has made it one of the biggest publishing phenomena of the 20th century. Published in three volumes in 1954 and 1955, The Lord of the Rings achieved cult status during the 1960s among students in the United States and Great Britain. Through his novel, Tolkien almost single-handedly reinvented the genre of modern heroic fantasy fiction, inspiring countless imitators whose works crowd the fantasy and science fiction sections of bookshops around the world. It was like pulling you into a world and you could say, okay, he's talking about that, but wait, over there, look at this. You know. Read, 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 read go past the bookmark, carry on, carry on, into the next book. Brilliant. It's overwhelmingly impressive in its, in its plots, its subplots, its twists and turns. It's a lot of fun to read. Your breath can be taken away by the style of the prose. He's a master craftsman. Without Lord of the Rings, we wouldn't have people like Terry Pratchett very dynamic, colourful writer, and I think I, I hold that as an influence myself. Well, I think it's above all a marvellous story which holds your attention and which creates a totally absolute um, convincing world. And um, you then can feel yourself totally in that world, totally convinced by it. I, I remember once being asked, who's your audience? And I, and I thought, well, anyone who's listened to Pink Floyd, anyone who's read Lord of the Rings or seen Star Wars, and, and I, I guess those are the kind of culture-defining events. I mean, I think somebody some uh, reviewer in the press back in the 50s said the world is going to be divided into those who have and those who haven't, you know, read it and got it. The geography of Tolkien's Middle Earth loosely resembles that of Western Europe. In fact, Tolkien conceived of it as the northwestern corner of the Eurasian landmass before it took its present shape. But Middle Earth contains no features that match any existing areas of present day Europe. The resemblance is more general. Fertile plains bounded by mountain ranges and crossed by wide rivers. A sea to the west that washes a long coastline of rugged cliffs, broad bays, and river estuaries. A climate that ranges from subarctic in the far north to subtropical in the far south. Familiar, but not too familiar. The most impressive uh, fairly remote from here. Like a little place on the extreme uh, Yorkshire East Coast called Roos, R-O-W-S. Various places they can, but uh, of course, since I'm always very conscious of my position, as I say, I can remember the position which where the window was when I'm writing a lot of uh, places I've lived in, of course, are connected with the very family in my mind with the story, the emotions at the time. Probably the most familiar region of Middle-earth, for British readers at least, is the Hobbit's own native land, which they call the Shire. Its rolling fields, hedges, woods and lanes have the feel of the English countryside, if not always its exact appearance. Hobbit dwellings, for example, tended to be burrowed into hillsides, with round windows and doors. Its inhabitants, though gregarious enough among their own kind, tend to shun the larger world beyond the borders of the Shire and take little notice of its affairs devoting all their attention to their own comfortable existences and the doings of their friends and relations. Just beyond the Shire's eastern border lies the old forest. 
a dense and ancient wood bounded to the west and the south by a wide bend of the Brandywine River, and to the east by the Barrow Downs. It is all that remains of a much older and greater forest, which once covered all the land from the Misty Mountains in the east to the Blue Mountains in the west. Many of its trees harbor a deep malice towards all two-legged creatures, and they can harass and even waylay travelers who enter their realm. To the east of the old forest stretch the Barrow Downs, a series of high mounds raised many centuries earlier to serve as the burial places of kings. Tumble-down rings of standing stones crown many of the barrows, and they are haunted by barrow whites, evil spirits perhaps once allied to the dead king's enemies. They too are a peril to the hapless traveler who finds himself abroad among the silent mounds at night. The east road from the Shire skirts the northern reaches of the old forest and the barrow downs. After passing through many miles of uninhabited hill country, it approaches the hidden valley of Rivendell. Deep in its wooded vales stands the house of Elrond, an elf lord whose power has long sustained Rivendell as a secure refuge against the evil of Sauron. East of Rivendell rise the Misty Mountains, a range of lofty peaks that stretches from the northern waste to the Gap of Rohan in the south. At the time of the events in the Lord of the Rings, orcs inhabit many stretches of the Misty Mountains, in tunnels of their own making, and also in the underground halls and galleries of Moria, a fabulous but now desolate dwelling fashioned by the dwarves many centuries earlier. Beyond the Misty Mountains and the great river Anduin stands the forest of Mirkwood. In its southern reaches, Sauron built the Tower of Dol Guldur for himself, where he resided before his return to his original stronghold in Mordor. The forest is thus haunted by the presence of orcs and other unpleasant creatures, but in its northern reaches lies the underground realm of the reclusive Green Elves, whose presence counters somewhat the evil powers that hem them around. Between the Misty Mountains and the River Anduin, opposite the southernmost edge of Mirkwood, stands the much smaller forest of Lothlorien. Here, the elf queen Galadriel and her spouse Celeborn, who have lived in Middle-earth from the earliest days of the First Age, govern a land whose beauty recalls that of the elves' ancient realms in the days of their greatest power, nearly all of which were destroyed by the end of the First Age. Beyond the southern tip of the Misty Mountains, a region of grassy plains stretches for many miles to the feet of the White Mountains. This is the Gap of Rohan, inhabited by the Rohirrim, or the Riders of Rohan, a warrior society of men allied with Gondor. South of the White Mountains is the Kingdom of Gondor, a plain crossed by many rivers, including the Anduin itself, which reaches the sea in a great delta on Gondor's southern frontier. Built into the easternmost shoulders of the White Mountains is the city of Minas Tirith, citadel to the kings of Gondor, which was founded by men of great stature and power who came to Middle-earth from across the Western Sea at the end of the Second Age. To the east of Gondor, across the waters of the Anduin, Sauron established his own realm of Mordor. Fenced in by two towering mountain ranges, the Ash Mountains to the north and the Mountains of Shadow to the west and the south. In its barren central plain stand Mount Doom, the volcanic peak that is also Sauron's forge, and the Black Tower of Barad-dûr, Sauron's stronghold.
No one was more surprised by the Lord of the Rings enthusiastic reception than Tolkien himself. Born in 1892 to the wife of an English bank clerk in Bloemfontein, South Africa, he spent most of his childhood in England's West Midlands, where his family moved after his father's untimely death in 1896. In 1900, his mother converted to Roman Catholicism, a decision that was to have a profound impact on Tolkien's life and imagination. Equally profound in its effect on his life and outlook was his mother's own untimely death in 1904 of complications arising from diabetes. Ronald, as Tolkien preferred to be called, and his brother Hilary were looked after by an aunt and came to live in a boarding house where, in 1908, Tolkien met Edith Bratt, a fellow lodger, three years his senior, and, like him, an orphan. After a long courtship, beset with difficulties arising from their different religious backgrounds, Edith eventually converted to Catholicism, and she and Ronald married in 1916. In the meantime, Tolkien had begun his studies at the University of Oxford in 1911, where he studied the classics and Old English, the language of Anglo-Saxon England, as well as Old Norse, Gothic, Welsh, and Finnish. His studies and lifelong interest in the history of the languages of Northern Europe inspired him to try his hand at inventing languages of his own, a pastime that eventually led him to write both poems and stories set in an imaginary world. For, having invented a language, he felt compelled to invent a history for it as well. Tolkien sought to create, even before he started to write, an English myth. The Finns had the Kalevala, the Icelanders had the Eddas. Everybody had a particular national myth. And Tolkien felt that the English were deprived of a national myth. Uh, he felt, I think, that the Arthurian legends were an imported French myth and, and weren't authentically English. They weren't Anglo-Saxon enough. He was a tremendous gallophobe. Uh, Tolkien was, didn't like the French at all. And uh, he wanted there to be a genuine Anglo-Saxon myth for the English people. To create an English myth, you've got to understand a little bit about the history. Uh, we get Anglo-Saxons coming, we get Scandinavian people coming, Danes people coming, and it all influences on our language and our way of life. So it's, it, it is the sort of root of what is modern England and, and the language. And obviously his knowledge of runes, his knowledge of Anglo-Saxon, his knowledge of, of, of linguistic structures is formidable and, you know, impressive. When the First World War broke out, a lot of people charged off to the front. A lot of people went off, enlisted, and, and many of these people were, were killed good and early in the war. Tolkien very rationally did not pay attention to these, these calls to go to war, and he completed his degree at Oxford, although at the time he did join the, the Officers' Training Corps, the OTC, at Oxford. Uh, and the deal was that once he finished his degree, he would go off and get killed. And he went off to France and arrived immediately before the beginning of the Battle of the Somme. It was during his service in the trenches that Tolkien began to write a cycle of stories set in an imaginary world that eventually took shape as the Middle Earth of the Lord of the Rings. In the first days of the Battle of the Somme, a lot of Tolkien's boyhood friends were killed, and in the days following the Battle of the Somme, uh, the rest of Tolkien's school friends, with one exception, were killed. So what Tolkien, like many of his generation, saw of war was a great deal of pointless enthusiasm, followed by a great deal of pointless misery, followed by a pointless aftermath in which nobody could figure out why they'd fought the war in the first place. And I think 
quite often writers actually write things as a way of exercising the, the terrible things they've seen. And it's probably a reflection on lots of soldiers because the First World War probably dehumanised a lot of people while they were fighting in the trenches. Certainly you have questioning. I wonder whether this chap had a family and why he came and took part. And at one point you have Sam looking at a dead Haradrim. And Sam is there going, oh, I wonder yeah, where he came from. Did he really want to fight? Now that's sort of the kind of question that somebody who has been through a real war does ask because they value life and humanity. After the war, he found employment in Oxford as an assistant lexicographer on the project that produced the first edition of the Oxford English Dictionary. In 1920, he was appointed to a readership in English language and literature at the University of Leeds, where he taught Old and Middle English and Old Norse, and in 1925 he was appointed Rawlinson and Bosworth Professor of Anglo-Saxon at Oxford, where he spent the rest of his working life until his retirement in 1959. Because well, I lived first in the little house, which again, the fate follows me again, is the uh, first house I ever had. I mean, it's now just, just been destroyed. I was in what is now called Pusey Street. Then when I came back to Oxford, I lived in two houses in North Road. They're both associated with uh, my writing, particularly the second one, uh, number 20, which now belongs to Trinity College, and which was built by Basil Blackmore. And then when the war was over, and most of my, what property I had had been destroyed. I had to move back to the, the little house in Manor Road, which is now opposite the uh, English Library. That's where the Lord of the Rings was, uh, uh, was, was uh, actually finished, or finalized, as they would say. A lot of the writing and revision took place at an interesting place, uh, a house, I think, which, well, which, which belonged to the Lytton family. I think it belonged to Bulwer Lytton, actually. Which then became, has uh, since then become a school, uh, the Oratory School, uh, which we moved from Edgbaston in Birmingham, and then moved uh, there in the wartime. As a headmaster friend of mine, I was stayed a whole large part of one long vacation there. I was given a, one of the master's rooms, my public peace and quiet, and I banging away on a typewriter, I did most of the re uh, revision of the Lord of the Rings. As an academic, his publications were influential, but few and his life with Edith and their growing family in a quiet Oxford suburb might well have proved no more remarkable than that of many another Oxford don. But one day, as Tolkien tells the story, while he was struggling to mark a pile of student examinations, he found himself writing a strange sentence on a blank page in one student's exam booklet. In a hole in the ground there lived a hobbit. Tolkien began to wonder what sort of a creature a hobbit was, and why it lived in a hole. He turned his speculations into stories he told his children. How it began, I would think, in 1926-27, when we first went to Oxford, and was told us at Christmas time, uh, in chapters, which is why it has chapters of adventures. We, if we were lucky, we got a couple of extra chapters each Christmas, and the other ones had to be repeated, so it got sort of longer and longer and longer. Gollum lived on a slimy island of rock in the middle of the lake. He was watching Bilbo now from the distance with his pale eyes like telescopes. Bilbo could not see him, but he was wondering a lot about Bilbo, for he could see that he was no goblin at all. Gollum got into his boat and shut off from the island while Bilbo was sitting on the brink, altogether flummoxed and at the end of his way in his wits. Suddenly up came Gollum and whispered and hissed, Bless us and splash us, my precious! The typescript came by chance to the attention of the publishers George Allen and Unwin, who invited Tolkien to complete it for the firm's consideration. Well, my father, who was the publisher, believed, and I think rightly, that children were the best judges of children's books. And so when I was a ten-year-old, he used to bring home children's book manuscripts. Luckily for me and for everybody else, um, I wrote uh, an approving report. Got paid my shilling, which was probably the best shilling this firm's ever spent, and um, the book was published. It's a fantastic story. It's fantastical. There's dragons. It, it feeds on all the elements that 
kids over the centuries have been given for their sort of entertainment. It was an immediate success as a children's book, so much so that Stanley Unwin asked Tolkien to write a sequel. The new story, which Tolkien referred to for a long time as the new Hobbit, grew into a very different creation from its predecessor. As Tolkien himself said in his own preface to The Lord of the Rings, this tale grew in the telling, an understatement as epic as the new story itself. Tolkien was first asked in about 1937, after publishing The Hobbit, if he could write a sequel. And it's a good 20 years before he finally starts delivering manuscripts. And it took a year between the second volume and the third volume because Tolkien keeps on editing and redacting and adding material and all that. He's a, he was a, a, a terrible perfectionist, niggling, he called it. He was, he was interested in niggling the detail. And as a result, the book is tremendously complex. His friend C.S. Lewis turned out all seven Narnia books in the course of seven years one book a year for seven years, fulfilled the terms of a contract. C.S. Lewis rarely looked at a manuscript when he was done writing. He'd just send it off to the publisher and rely on the editors to sort it out. Tolkien insisted that every detail be, uh, be, be looked into carefully. Tolkien chose the magic invisibility conferring ring acquired on his travels by Bilbo Baggins and the Hobbit as the link to the new narrative. As he had once puzzled over the strange word he'd invented in an idle scribble in an exam booklet, now he wondered about the ring. What was its history? What was the source of its power? Pondering these questions one day in the bath, Tolkien realized that Bilbo's ring was the work of Sauron, a figure of deep evil from the cycle of tales he'd been writing and rewriting in private for over 20 years. In this fashion, the world of Tolkien's Hobbits was drawn into a far larger world, a world with a long and mostly tragic history that Tolkien had already shaped and would go on shaping until his death. Tolkien spent many years dividing his time between fulfilling his academic obligations and writing The Lord of the Rings, which, as he wrote, expanded into a far longer and more complex narrative than he'd ever intended. His work on the novel spanned all the years of the Second World War and beyond. He sent drafts of some chapters to his son Christopher, then serving with the Royal Air Force in South Africa, and he read other chapters aloud at the weekly gatherings in Oxford of a group of his friends and associates who came to refer to themselves as the Inklings. These included Tolkien's friend and colleague C.S. Lewis and the poet Charles Williams. Lewis was particularly vociferous in his appreciation of Tolkien's writing, and Tolkien conceded that without Lewis's loud encouragement, he might never have been able to finish the work. But finish it he did, and in 1954, the first volume of the book Tolkien had never intended to write was published. When I read the book, I, the idea I had was that I'd love to find a book that came out of his world, you, you know, not something that was made in a factory and stuff like that. I wanted to find, not necessarily handwritten, but it just, it just had to come from the world of Lord of the Rings. I first read Lord of the Rings the way a lot of people do, certainly the way a lot of boys do in, in school, in, in high school. And you know, my friends were reading it, and, and therefore I read it. And, of course, you see later on, if, if you reread it, that there's a lot of stuff that you really appreciate when you're a kid, but there's a whole lot of stuff that you miss when you read Lord of the Rings as a kid. The first time you read it, you get to certain points, certain cut-offs in the dramatic tension, and you're leaping ahead to find out what happens next. Um, and you read it again straight after, because you know you've missed bits because you've... you've what happens next when you're reading so fast? You, you miss little nuances and subtleties in the text. I know a lot of officer cadets that I teach and a lot of officers that I teach have read Lord of the Rings as kids, as schoolboys. The women rarely have read Lord of the Rings. And a lot of them have filed it away in their mind as just a book they read when they were kids and they miss. They miss a lot of what Tolkien has to say, certainly with respect to war. 
The events narrated in The Lord of the Rings are, of course, many and complex. It opens in the Shire, where Bilbo Baggins is about to celebrate his 111st birthday. Joining him for the festivities are his nephew and heir, Frodo Baggins, and the wizard Gandalf, Bilbo's companion and guide, on the journey he took many years before, during which he acquired his magic ring. Having grown weary of his quiet life in the Shire, Bilbo has decided to use this party as an occasion to stage a very public departure. Following Gandalf's advice, he reluctantly passes the ring to Frodo and goes off, leaving his nephew in possession of his house at Bag End. Years later, Gandalf returns and reveals to Frodo what he has long suspected, that the ring is the work of Sauron who shaped it in ages past as an instrument of power and domination. It had been taken from Sauron after his defeat by the last alliance of elves and men many centuries before, but it was lost only to come into Bilbo's possession by seeming chance as Sauron was again gathering allies and threatening to subdue the whole world to his tyranny. Should he regain the ring, no other power in Middle-earth could oppose him. Before setting off on an urgent errand of his own, Gandalf urges Frodo to leave the Shire and seek refuge and advice from Elrond in Rivendell. After some procrastination, Frodo sets off with his hobbit friends Sam and Pippin just as mysterious and menacing black riders have begun to appear in the Shire, inquiring after Baggins. Pursued by these riders, the hobbits meet up with a fourth friend, Merry, and together they flee into the old forest in an attempt to shake them off. There they are sheltered by the extraordinary Tom Bombadil, in appearance a stocky, bearded man, much given to laughter and spontaneous outbursts of light verse. Bombadil gently reveals to his guests that he is in fact the oldest living being in Middle-earth, an embodiment of all the forces of nature and life that have shaped the land and its inhabitants. Like those forces, Bombadil is enormously powerful within his own realm, but beyond it he can do little to counter Sauron's evil. After leaving Bombadil's house, the hobbits pass through the Barrow Downs, where they are caught and imprisoned by a Barrow White. Bombadil rescues them and arms them with ancient swords from the Barrow's hoard before seeing them safely to the outskirts of Bree, a town on their route. In Bree, the hobbits learn that the Black Riders have not abandoned their pursuit, and they meet a tall, weather-beaten man called Strider, one of a number of solitary wanderers called Rangers, famed mostly for their abilities as trackers and woodsmen. Strider reveals himself as a partner in Gandalf's long effort to thwart Sauron's designs and offers to help them bring the ring to Rivendell safely. The hobbits accept him as their guide and he leads them on a perilous trek on foot through the desolate lands between Bree and Rivendell, which they reach in safety, but not before Frodo receives a terrible wound from the knife of the Chief of the Ring Wraiths. The Black Riders are the nine mortal men doomed to die, once great kings who turned to evil and accepted their own rings of power from Sauron, which conferred on them a portion of their master's power and terror. The rings conferred immortality on their wearers, but in time the kings faded to invisible wraiths, the Nazgul, able to cloak themselves in human attire and wielding a power to subdue and terrify wills weaker than their own. In Rivendell, Frodo is healed of his wound. He is reunited with Bilbo, who was living in Rivendell since his departure from the Shire. They take part in a council summoned by Elrond, to which come representatives of all the free peoples of Middle-earth. There, the full story of the ring is revealed, from the time it was cut from the hand of Sauron, through its loss and accidental discovery by Gollum then a hobbit-like creature himself who, once he possessed the ring, hid for centuries beneath the Misty Mountains, where after many years it slipped from his finger just in time for it to be stumbled upon by Bilbo, as the story is told in The Hobbit. The council debates what can be done with the ring. Elrond and Gandalf propose that it be destroyed, since its evil power would corrupt anyone who attempted to use it, however benign their motives but the only way the ring can be unmade is for it to be cast into the fires of Mount Doom in Mordor, where Sauron first forged it. 
Recognizing the impossibility of achieving this by open war on Sauron, whose power by then had grown too great, the Council appoints Frodo, as the Ring's present bearer, to seek the cracks of doom and there destroy the Ring. His only hope is in stealth, so the Council elects a small band of companions to travel with Frodo and aid him on his quest. The wizard Gandalf leads the company, and with him the ranger Strider, whose real name is Aragorn. At Rivendell he declared to all his full identity and lineage, which reaches back in direct descent to Elendil and Isildur, the first kings of Gondor, who led the forces of men in the last alliance that defeated Sauron many centuries earlier. Also representing men is Boromir, son and heir of Denethor, the steward of Gondor, who undertook the long journey to Rivendell in response to his brother Faramir's prophetic dream. Representing the dwarves is Gimli, the son of Gloin, who was one of the thirteen dwarves in whose company Bilbo had set out on his very first adventure. For the elves goes Legolas, son of Thranduil, the king of the green elves in Mirkwood. Frodo and his three friends, Sam, Merry, and Pippin, make up the remainder of the company. Merry and Pippin beg to go, against Elrond's advice that more powerful members of his own household should go instead. In this, Gandalf unexpectedly takes the young hobbit's part, suggesting that it may be wiser to trust to their friendship with Frodo than to strength and prudence. Coalition warfare is currently a very hot topic, has been since the Gulf War, and uh, coalition warfare was a hot topic during the Second World War. There was tremendous friction between the British, the French, the Americans, the Poles, the Norwegians, all of the elements of the Allies, as well as friction between the Germans, the Japanese, and the Italians. And this is represented to us by, uh, by Tolkien. Not directly. Nobody stands for the French or the British or the Poles. But we see that, for instance, there is a long-standing ethnic discord between elves and dwarves in Lord of the Rings. Has been around for a long time. Elves and dwarves just don't get along. And in order to form of an effective team, the elves and the dwarves have to put their differences aside in order to achieve a synergy among, uh, among the coalition partners. So Tolkien is very carefully showing us that everybody has to get together to get the job done. Even people who don't want to go to war, like the hobbits, people who are naturally not warlike, they have to go to war in order to get the job done. Setting forth on foot from Rivendell, the Fellowship of the Ring passes south through the uninhabited lands to the west of the Misty Mountains. Following Gandalf's advice, they attempt to cross the mountains in secret by finding a way through the mines of Moria, a vast subterranean maze of tunnels and great halls delved in past ages by the dwarves. The company makes the long journey in the dark, and just before they reach the eastern gate of Moria, they are assaulted by a company of orcs. Barely able to fend these off, they retreat to a narrow bridge over a fathomless chasm. As Gandalf sends the others across and stands to defend the bridge, a monstrous shadow rears up from behind the orcs' ranks, kindling into flame as it rises. It is a Balrog, an evil fire spirit, one of many who once served Sauron's master and teacher Morgoth in the first age of Middle-earth. Gandalf challenges the Balrog, shattering the bridge at its feet. But as it falls, a thong of its whip curls around Gandalf's legs and drags him to the brink and over. The rest of the company obeys his last cry to flee and make their way out of the gate ahead. Aragorn leads them to the forest of Lothlorien, where they are sheltered and advised by Galadriel and Celeborn. Preserved by their power from the ravages of time and Sauron's evil, Lothlorien is a refuge of great beauty and healing power. At their parting, Galadriel presents the members of the company with many gifts, among them three boats that allow them to continue south on the waters of the Anduin. This they do until they pause above the great falls of Roros, where they must choose what path they will take. Frodo hesitates, knowing that the ring must go east into Mordor, but reluctant to have his friends follow him into what seems certain torment and death. While he sits alone to ponder his dilemma, 
he is confronted by Boromir, who, overcome with desire to use the ring's power for the defense of Gondor, tries to take it from Frodo by force. Frodo escapes Boromir and decides to leave for Mordor alone. In this he nearly succeeds, but his closest friend Sam guesses his intentions and follows him. At this moment, the rest of the company are attacked by a party of orcs. Aragorn, trying to reassemble the company's scattered members, comes upon Boromir badly wounded amid a heap of orcs he has slain. Before he dies, he tells Aragorn that the orcs have captured two hobbits whom he tried to save. Aragorn, Legolas, and Gimli consign Boromir's body to the waters of the Anduin, and after establishing that Frodo and Sam have departed for Mordor, choose to pursue the raiding party in the hope of rescuing Merry and Pippin. The orc trail leads them back northwards, across the fields of Rohan, where after several days they are met by a party of riders who are returning from an engagement with the orcs who'd captured Merry and Pippin. The riders, however, can give them no news of their friend's fate. What none of them knows is that Merry and Pippin were able to escape the orcs, taking advantage of a quarrel among their captors, some of whom served Mordor, and others the renegade wizard Saruman. He was once the head of Gandalf's order, but is now in an uneasy alliance with Sauron. Merry and Pippin escape to the forest of Fangorn, an ancient wood inhabited by Ents, extremely old tree-like creatures whom the elves know as the Shepherds of Trees. Their leader, Treebeard, befriends the two hobbits and tells them of the terrible injuries his trees have suffered at the hands of Saruman and his orcs. The news that the hobbits bring of impending war stirs the Ents to action, and they resolve to move against Saruman. Searching the outskirts of Fangorn for signs of the hobbits, Aragorn, Legolas, and Gimli are met to their surprise and joy by Gandalf, returned to life after his deadly combat with the Balrog. With him they journey to the halls of Theoden, the king of the Rohirrim in Rohan. Old and beset by many cares, including the recent death in battle of his own son and heir, Theoden sits in his hall, sunk into a despair made even darker by the counsel of his advisor Wormtongue, who is in fact a spy of Saruman's. Gandalf succeeds in exposing Wormtongue and rousing Theoden to a last defense of his imperiled kingdom. Against an invading army of orcs and men dispatched by Saruman, the army of Rohan makes a heroic stand in Helm's Deep, a fortified retreat built into the northern slopes of the White Mountains. There, Aragorn, Legolas, and Gimli fight alongside the men of Rohan in a desperate night-long battle that ends in an unlooked-for victory, when Saruman's forces are overtaken from behind by a host of Huarns, beings in appearance trees but capable of sudden movement and filled with an implacable hatred of orcs. The Huarns were sent by Treebeard after he and his Ents had reduced Saruman's citadel of Isengard to rubble and trapped the defeated wizard in his tower. Aragorn learns that the Rohirrim cannot muster their forces in time to come to the aid of Minas Tirith, the chief city of Gondor now under attack by Sauron's main army. He resolves to follow a dark but prophesied road that leads to the Paths of the Dead, an underground way through the White Mountains haunted by the restless spirits of men who, in the days of the Last Alliance, broke an oath to serve Aragorn's ancestor Elendil. Aragorn, Legolas, and Gimli ride with a party of Aragorn's fellow rangers from the north to seek the paths of the dead. Merry, who'd formed an attachment to the aged King Theoden, remains with the forces of Rohan gathering to ride to Minas Tirith. Gandalf departs at once with Pippin for the city, reaching it a day before Sauron's forces close the siege. All this while, Frodo and Sam have been doing their best to negotiate the barren and difficult approach to Mordor. In their wanderings, they are overtaken by Gollum, whose desire to possess the ring once again has driven him to pursue them. But Frodo, with a newfound mastery that springs from his sense of urgency and from his possession of the ring, subdues him and demands that he leave them to complete their quest. Gollum begs to serve Frodo, offering to show him and Sam a secret way into Mordor. He leads them through Ithilien, a wooded land between the Anduin and the Mountains of Shadow that form Mordor's western frontier. There they encounter Faramir, 
brother of the slain Boromir, who is patrolling Gondor's outlands just ahead of the invasion. He chooses to let them continue on their errand, and after they part, Gollum leads them to the high mountain pass of Kirith Ungol, where he betrays them to Shilab, a monstrous spider who lurks in the tunnels they must pass through. The hobbits escape, but not before Frodo is stung, and Sam, believing him dead, takes the ring in order to try to fulfill the quest. Before he gets very far, however, Sam learns that Frodo was only stunned, and that orcs from the nearby tower of Minas Morgul have seized him. Unable to leave his friend behind, Sam abandons all thought of the quest in a successful bid to free Frodo. They then set off to cross the plain of Gorgoroth. In Minas Tirith, meanwhile, the siege has reached a desperate stage, with the city's first ring of walls taken and its steward, Denethor, about to commit suicide in the face of what seems to him Sauron's certain triumph. Gandalf rallies the city's forces as the Rohirrim arrive at dawn. The charge of the Rohirrim at the turn of fields. There's this huge, you know, sorcerous cloud bank over the main city that's being besieged. There's fires inside the walls. There's an army encamped and entrenched outside it. And the horses have slowly picked their way down the valley. And then suddenly, boom, big charge. And it's almost like you're reading it and you get the impression that there was a massive wave that's coming crashing across this plain, and it's a wave of horsemen. Spears, you know, swords, the lot. Completely by surprise. And it's just amazing the way it happens. In the ensuing battle, Theoden is killed, and his niece, Eowyn, who has joined his warriors in disguise, defends his body against the king of the ringwraiths. In her desire to join the battle, she had allowed Merry to ride hidden with her, as the Nazgul towers over her, Merry creeps up behind and stabs him with the blade he'd taken from the Barrow Downs, and it kills the Nazgul. With their captain unexpectedly fallen, Sauron's forces fall into disarray and are routed. In the subsequent conference among the leaders of Gondor and its allies, Gandalf advises that a force be dispatched to assault the Black Gates of Mordor, not in the hope of achieving a military victory, but as a simple diversion to keep Sauron's eye distracted from his real peril in the form of two hobbits crawling through the choking dust and ash of his own realm. Lord of the Rings is a story of ends and means. Sauron has to be defeated. That is what the book is all about. That is what Gandalf wants to achieve. In fact, that is Gandalf's mission in Middle-earth. Once he achieves it, he leaves Middle-earth, goes west with the elves. He must defeat Sauron. There are other people in the book who are not as focused on the mission. The men of Minas Tirith, Boromir, Denethor, they want to take Sauron's ring and use it to achieve victory in battle. Gandalf has to say no. We are not going to achieve victory in battle. That's not the aim. The aim is to destroy Sauron by destroying the ring. We must concentrate on achieving the aim. We, we, we don't need to fixate on the means of achieving the end. We need to concentrate on achieving the aim. And that is uh, an important message about war. You don't fight a war for the sake of fighting a war. In the, in the First World War, the, the Germans completely lost sight of why they'd been fighting, forgot why they were fighting. Why are we fighting? To win. Win the, on the battlefield. Defeat the enemy army. And what Tolkien is saying is you don't have to go out and defeat an army in order to win. You just have to achieve your objective. And if you can achieve your objective without fighting a big battle, without risking destruction in battle, then you still win. After a journey that has tested their bodies and spirits beyond what any thought they could bear, Frodo and Sam reach Mount Doom. There, Gollum attacks them at once, having followed them to the very end of their quest. Sam overpowers him, however, and sends Frodo off to complete their errand. He ponders killing Gollum, but cannot bring himself to do it. He follows Frodo and finds him standing on the brink of the fiery gulf, where Frodo announces that he will not destroy the ring and claims it for himself, placing it on his finger and disappearing. At that moment, Gollum rushes in and grapples with the invisible Frodo, biting off his ring finger. As he dances with glee at having at last recovered his lost treasure, he slips and falls into the fire. 
and thus is the ring and all Sauron's power destroyed. His fortifications crumble, his forces are put to flight, and he himself follows his master Morgoth into the outer void, never to trouble Middle-earth again. Out of the east there came a great eagle flying, and he bore tidings beyond hope from the laws of the west, crying, Sing now, ye people of the Tower of Anor, for the realm of Sauron is ended forever, and the dark tower is thrown down. Sing and rejoice, ye people of the Tower of God, for your watch hath not been in vain, and the black gate is broken, and your king hath passed through, and he is victorious. Sing and be glad, all ye children of the West, for your king shall come again, and he shall dwell among you all the days of your life. And the tree that was withered shall be renewed, and he shall plant it in the high places, and the city shall be blessed. Sing, all ye people. And the people sang in all the ways of the city. There were German Tolkien fans, English Tolkien fans, French, Brazilians, Japanese. The book's in, I think, something like at least 25 languages, maybe more, sold around the world. And the interesting thing about Tolkien is that he created a world which all kinds of creative people went into and explored separately. I mean, the number of writers who went there, I mean, let alone artists, it's, it's, it, he, he switched on a switch that illuminated a lot of worlds, a lot of images, a lot of words, millions of words. That The Lord of the Rings has proved enormously popular, none can deny. But to this day, it remains something of an enigma in the world of literary criticism. Is it just, as some of its critics have claimed, a glorified comic book adventure story? Or is it, as some of its most devoted readers insist, a great work of literature worthy to be read alongside the likes of Tolstoy and Dickens? There's a huge debate about the word great in contemporary academic circles. I don't think I would use the word great to apply to any particular text. I think there's a sense of a much more relative uh, relationship between the text and the world, um, the text and the context, and how it interacts. I think the question perhaps is, we should be addressing is why fantasy is regarded as subsidiary to realism, for example, or um, poetry, and all those other genres which are regarded as high art. Um, and part of that is to do with its origins in folk tale and uh, the oral tradition. There was, I think the split occurred, and I think there is a very definite split that occurs. Um, a preference for realist literature in, in the 19th century. And there's this clear kind of impulse to speak the truth about society and these big world views. Tolkien believed that you could tell more truth with myth than you can with history. Tolkien believed that history in, in the sense of relating facts to an audience as facts was a weak way of conveying ideas. It was tendentious, it was, it was facile, it lacked depth and it lacked meaning. And he felt that myth was a far better way of conveying the truth. And his friend C.S. Lewis said, well, myth is, is lies. And Tolkien said, no, myth isn't lies. Myth is a story that tells you something so important that it doesn't matter whether it's literally true. What's important is the idea that's conveyed. Many professional critics tend to regard The Lord of the Rings, if they regard it at all, with a varying mix of indifference, condescension, and contempt. In a prevailing climate that favors street-smart irony and all manner of gleeful postmodern mayhem, few will champion a tale of wonder laced with quasi-medieval moralizing and narrated with 19th century earnestness. For many, it occupies an uncomfortable middle ground between children's literature and adult fiction. For others, its idealization of kingship is anti-democratic and its depiction of orcs racist. Well, there's a myth, actually, that the orcs, O-R-C for orc, is, is Oxford Rugby Club, and it is... Uh, 
Tolkien's disdain for, for the Oxford Rugby Club. But this, this is not, I understand the case. Tolkien creates the orcs as a representation of industrial warfare. There is no particular culture that is represented by the orcs. And this is distinct from a lot of German fantasy fiction and softcore pornography of the late 19th and early 20th century, in which there are subhuman characters who are quite explicitly meant to represent ethnic groups. In the German version of this synthetic enemy, you can quite clearly see that they're very Jewish looking or very Slavic looking or very, very black looking. Tolkien does not do that. Tolkien creates a synthetic species and they're meant to be soldiers and they're very durable and they, they can march a long way and they, they kill anything they come across and they trample down green grass just for the sake of it. They break things that don't need to be broken. They hate life. These are, these are industrial warriors and you can see the orcs in Hitler's army, in Stalin's army, in the British army, where Tolkien saw orcs. And when his son Christopher was in the British army in the, uh, in the Second World War, in his correspondence they referred to the, the martinets or the square bashers, the people overly concerned with, with the brutality of war as the orcs. And Tolkien sees orcs all over. Uh, he sees them in the people who, who build roads where he doesn't think there ought to be a road. And he sees the, the manufacturers of motor cars uh, in, in uh, mid-20th century England as being orcs who have given, been given the gift of technology. They're, he calls them the, the orcs who have found, found the, the ring. So uh, Tolkien creates them to represent all that is bad about modern war. I think there's a lot of the rage for order. You know, it's come out of this very turbulent century, the 20th century, although it has its roots in the 19th century. I think it really is part of the first golden age, even though it's written so late on um, in, in the 20th century. Um, but there is this century of, of huge upheaval, you know, the two world wars, mechanization, um, creeping, um, urbanization, all the isations, and um, this sense that there must be this, this desire to return to the golden age is there very strongly. You can see it in other, in other fantasy fiction, you see it in Wind in the Willows, for example, and certainly in C.S. Lewis, who's obviously his, his, uh, his partner in fiction. If you can't take Tolkien away from this sort of environment, this is probably one of the great influences and when he lived here as a child this was probably one of the happiest times in his life because it was such a nice and pleasant place and when they move into the, back into the city they're going into a Victorian city with steam trams awesome levels of pollution and coming from a place like this to go into uh, a big Victorian city and they were all probably were immensely dirty um, it must have been a huge change and it's just such a, a big thing for somebody to happen one of the most serious charges leveled against The Lord of the Rings by its critics is that Tolkien's characters lack depth. Tolkien's work was published well after the novels of James Joyce, D. H. Lawrence, and Virginia Woolf had made an intense interest in the inner movements of characters' minds, almost an obligation for the modern novelist. But Tolkien had not set out to write a modern novel. His treatment of his characters was heavily influenced by the literature of the Middle Ages, which he both studied and taught as an academic and loved as a reader. It isn't a work that deals with character. So it is plot driven, really. The characters are, by and large, stereotypes. You know, some people might say archetypes, but I'm always a little bit skeptical about that. I'm not sure quite what the difference between an archetype and a stereotype is, except that one might be damaging and the other might seem a bit more attractive. People have complained about the characters, oh they're so cardboard cut out, and they're not. The characters are subtly written, and very briefly written perhaps. That works though, because it's meant to be mythical, 
and in you know, in Beowulf, you don't find out about Beowulf's problems with his mother and cleaning his room. You know, you don't get that. You don't need that to believe in Beowulf doing what he does. And so Frodo's motivation for like, you know, doing what he does, or Aragorn, it, it acts as a framework for you to dress the character mentally yourself as a reader. So every reader individualises the characters they're, they're reading about. Um, so the characters are, are brilliantly drawn by, if anything, being sketched. We hear almost no internal monologues, and what we hear of his characters' thoughts are often spoken aloud. Nearly all his major characters reveal themselves most fully in their deeds, and the choices they confront often have staggering moral and personal consequences. The characters in the foreground speak in voices that reflect their essential qualities. The Hobbit's plain speech and down-to-earth humour. The elevated diction of the elf lords such as Elrond, Galadriel and Celeborn. The ability of human characters such as Aragorn and Faramir to span both these registers. Gollum's profoundly wounded self-absorption. The brutalised police state snarlings of the orcs. Tolkien may not give us privileged glimpses into the secret workings of these characters' minds, but how they speak reveals a great deal of their inner nature. It, it's it's a, a, a well-tried and tested device. You take aspects of human nature, and we're all much more complex than that, and you elaborate on that aspect. So you have you know, the simple, well-meaning, um, rustic figure, the hobbit from the Shire, you have the Clint Eastwood strider, you know, the pale rider, kind of, you know, appearing on the horizon, you know, narrowing his eyes and looking down, planning his next move. Um, you can see these, you know, in a very kind of basic formalist way, cropping up all the way through um, fables, allegories, and into into westerns and movies. And um, it's it's. It's something that he's lifted directly from folk tales. And there's the, the national hero figure, you know, so whether that's um, resisting the powers that be like Robin Hood, or whether it's St. George and the Dragon, um, or whether it's King Arthur and Merlin, you know, they're all, they're all borrowed. Um, but we, we all have a kind of stock of those, and we, we respond, that's where we respond in a very formulaic way. That's where we become a very passive set of readers. Um, it's where we start to respond in a more complicated way is in relation to uh, baddies like Gollum. You know, because Gollum is delicious and Gollum is believable and Gollum is also, um, his plight is credible. We start to relate to him um, and also that happens to a certain extent with worm tongue in certain and it, it, it happens with, with Frodo and Bilbo, that there's something else going on there, something that's changing them. And it may be a force of evil, but it may just be, you know, that they've fallen on hard times. You know, we, we, so we, we can understand and sympathise that they're but for the grace of God. And I think that's quite interesting. They're not just pure evil. And that, that's where the, the, the negotiation and the slipperiness of, of any text appears. That's where I think um, books start to really appeal to me, is where, when, when they get out of the formula and start doing all that, that other stuff with identity. Tolkien creates standalone peoples, standalone ethnic groups. They exist independently of real world ethnic groups. They do things, they have ethnic characteristics, you might say, which may resemble racial characteristics, ethnic characteristics that we see in people today. But it is a mistake to expect Tolkien to represent any particular people in his writing. So while you do have a, uh, a, an apparently Germanic tribe, uh, the, the, uh, the Rohirrim, who uh, fight on horseback, and they're masters of horses, we're told, and they have a certain kind of social organization that is, is Germanic, and they have uh, a language which, which we don't see represented very often, but when we do, it's pretty much German or Gothic. 
Does that mean that Tolkien is showing us the Goths? No. Does it mean he's showing us the Franks? No. The Vandals? No. The Waffen SS? No. Just because these guys are blonde and, uh, and speak Gothic uh, or German and, uh, and behave in certain ways like certain Germanic tribes, that does not mean that is what he's trying to represent to us. Tolkien's creating a realistic, generic German tribe, if you will, and he's using it uh, as part of his story. At the same time, Tolkien's characters are, to a certain extent, representative figures. The elves embody superhuman reaches of beauty, memory, and regret. The dwarves, unbending will and resolve. And the humans, a range of possibilities from the intensely parochial locals in Bree to figures such as Aragorn and Faramir, whose far wider horizons confer on them something of the wisdom and dignity of the elves. As the characters through whose eyes we witness nearly all the action in The Lord of the Rings, the hobbits may be the most crucially representative characters. Although they're not human, they communicate the human dimension of the novel's grand narrative far more than the human characters themselves. In their bewilderment, horror, and wonder at the events they find themselves caught up in so unexpectedly, their responses are perhaps the most human of all. Why are the heroes of this book little people, literally, in the case of, of, of the hobbits? Why are they little people? Even Aragorn, who by the end of the book is a great hero and he's king and he's, he's great, at the beginning of the book, he is just this scruffy fellow who, who even the, the innkeeper doesn't like. Why are these little people great? Not because they have a shiny sword that glows in the dark. These people are great because they have the little person's strength to endure in the face of adversity. The little man, the British private soldier who Tolkien saw in the trenches in the Battle of the Somme. The kind of dedicated will that gets Tommy Atkins up over the trench parapet and walking slowly towards German machine guns. That level of individual heroism is what it's all about. It doesn't just deal with, you know, everyday functioning. It does tap into deeper emotional um, psycho and psychological depths, I think, and that's what's interesting about it. Not necessarily in the characters, but in, in the, the kinds of settings, for example, um, the ending of The Lord of the Rings, where the boats sail off towards the Grey Havens, towards the, uh, kind of the, the Isles of the Blessed, or however one might want to see that kind of other world. That, that desire for some sort of numinous um, space beyond death. Tolkien's acquaintance with medieval literature makes itself felt at many levels in The Lord of the Rings. At the most literal, perhaps, is his treatment of the Rohirrim, the riders of Rohan, whose language and culture Tolkien patterns closely on those of Anglo-Saxon England. When you read, for instance, the Rohirrim, the, uh, the people of Rohan, they often speak as though they were in Beowulf. They speak as though they're in an alliterative, metrical poem. And they speak with, with the same meter, actually, that, that, uh, that Beowulf has written in. And you can read the book three times and not ever notice the fact that, uh, that, that these people are speaking in this rhythm. They speak with alliteration. They speak like characters out of Norse myth. And that is a, uh, a tremendously powerful thing to have in a book. It's great. It's a really well done thing. In the text, ordinary common speech is represented by modern English. Thus, in the few instances where Tolkien chooses to represent the language of Rohan, he uses Old English. The name Theoden is actually an Old English word meaning lord or ruler. The writer's word for hobbits, Holbutlan, is a made-up Old English compound meaning hole builders. When Gandalf arrives with Aragorn, Legolas and Gimli at the doors of Meduseld, the name is another Old English compound meaning mead hall, their exchanges with the doorkeeper are a deliberate echo of a parallel scene in Beowulf. In that scene, the hero Beowulf, having come by sea to King Hrothgar's hall, is challenged by a coast watcher. And for his scene, Tolkien even borrows a few lines of their conversation almost word for word. The poems chanted by the Rohirrim, 
are modernized versions of Anglo-Saxon alliterative verse, and their warrior's code of honor draws on an identical code celebrated in many Anglo-Saxon poems. Tolkien draws on Old Norse tradition in a number of ways. His dwarf names, such as Thorin, Balin, and Gimli, occur in a number of Old Norse texts. We see little of the dwarves as a race in The Lord of the Rings, but in The Hobbit their character resembles that of the heroes of the Old Norse sagas, brave, stubborn, and relentless in their pursuit of revenge for injuries and wrongs done to them. So we have this, this small fellowship seeking out to accomplish a task, and there are echoes of the, the Yom's Vikings in this. There are echoes of, of all sorts of small groups of people throughout, especially Norse uh, mythology, but throughout the, the history of Europe, small groups of people setting out to accomplish a task. We have heroic women, which is a, a clear echo of Njal's saga in, in Tolkien. We have all kinds of echoes of historical examples. Tolkien's dragons, Smog in The Hobbit and Glaurung and, and Caligon in The Silmarillion have a literary ancestor in the dragon who figures so prominently in the final episode of Beowulf. Like Smog, the Beowulf dragon sleeps on a bed of hoarded gold and flies into a rage at the theft of a single cup. Less specific is Tolkien's use of medieval tradition in his characterization of elves. Tolkien disliked the sentimentalized Victorian notions of elves as diminutive winged creatures that inform a great many popular children's books in his time. For his own elves, Tolkien reached back into the depictions of elves and their realm of fairy in great medieval romances, such as Sir Orfeo and the Arthurian legends. In these texts, elves appear fully human in stature, though they are otherworldly in their beauty and concerns. Human encounters with elves in medieval texts tend to be fraught with as much peril as wonder. The unease expressed by men in both Rohan and Gondor at any mention of Galadriel's Lothlorien, their sense of it as a place of perilous enchantment, echoes the medieval attitude, though Tolkien refines this by taking us into Lothlorien to witness its profoundly benign beauty at first hand. For those men who know and love it, like Aragorn, the peril of Lothlorien arises not from its inhabitants, but from the evil a person may bring there in his own heart. You get that cropping up in, in Shakespeare as well. You get it in a lot of um, English literature. Um, you also get it in, in um, Scots and Irish literature. It's a very, that's a, a very problematic kind of influence, that idea of, you know, kind of man as mind and action, and woman as nature and kind of uh, nurture and all that side, side of things. Very few women that I teach have read Lord of the Rings. My wife never read Lord of the Rings until we were married, and she said it was because when she was a kid it was always a boy's book. It was never something that, that girls were encouraged to read. The women in Lord of the Rings, there are not a lot of them, but many of the women in Lord of the Rings are very strong characters. Eowyn is a strong character. She breaks out of gender boundaries. She leaves her uncle's house without his permission. She disguises herself as a man. She goes off to war. She strikes a decisive blow in war. I mean, she's breaking gender boundaries right and left. Uh, and I think there are a lot of people who'd far prefer girls to read romance stories and, and stories about women who stay in their boxes rather than about women who do that. The Lord of the Rings has had a noticeable influence on the arts. A great many visual artists have drawn on scenes from the novel for their subjects. Most notable amongst these is Roger Dean. I, I dipped in and allowed myself the incredible pleasure of being influenced by that world to do a, those three or four pictures. The famous one is Relea, and the cover of my book, Views, is a green castle, and there's two sequential paintings that go with that, with the same dragon and rider in it. And although they're not illustrations of Lord of the Rings, they were inspired by, definitely inspired by. It's a fabulous story and fabulous places, but not a lot of description. I mean, contrast it to Gormungast. You couldn't illustrate Gormungast because a thousand people would say, you missed the blue bit on the doorknob, you know, because there's so much detail, so much visual detail from Peak. But there's virtually none of that in Lord of the Rings. So 
um, it, it frees the imagination for me a great deal more. I mean, anyone illustrating Gormenghast is essentially a slave to Peak, but anyone illustrating Lord of the Rings, they go in there and it's perfectly free. They can do what they like. The world of rock music has also been heavily influenced by the writings of Tolkien. Groups such as Yes and Uriah Heep have drawn inspiration from his works. The imagery was definitely reflected in covers like Demons and Wizards, the Magician's Birthday and so on. Just the scope to which Tolkien used his imagination um, inspired me for sure. And it made me feel like my imagination, which is extraordinarily vivid and doesn't leave me alone most of the time, was actually okay. Because there are times when, when, you, when you have these dreams and you have these peculiar visions and you write these strange things, there are times when you wonder if you're actually okay. <laughs> we were all into sort of folklore, we were all into imagery, we were all into sort of things that were a little bit strange, a little bit weird, and, and Tolkien was a bit king at that. I mean, it's hard to find anybody who doesn't love music of, of, of the sort of type we were doing in the 70s and who didn't like Tolkien. In, in fact, I don't know of anybody who didn't. Uh, certainly John, who wrote a lot of the lyrics, um, uh, well, some people say that Tolkien was on another planet. I think it's probably where he met John Anderson. I mean, when he was alive, they were going to make a film, the first attempt to make a film, they were going to have the Beatles playing the characters. Um, John was going to be Gollum, Paul was going to be Frodo, um, George was going to be Gandalf, and Ringo was going to be Sam. And, you know, they, they can almost see them doing that, but they never actually succeeded. Tolkien's work continues to inspire rock music today, as in the music of the up-and-coming band Mostly Autumn. Well, the book in itself and the whole the whole trilogy, the whole the whole Lord of the Rings scene is a, is a great influence. I think it's magic. It's a magic escapism. You know, it's so so um, detailed that it's almost real. It's like the place does exist. Um, and I think I think the the magic of it and the scenes that Tolkien sets with his writing certainly inspires me and other members of the band to to put that into music. It's it's a fun thing, really. You know, it's uh, inspirational. Personally, I'd probably identify with characters like Galadriel. Uh, she, she's a good sort of, not a role model, but it's nice to sort of have that fairy-esque angle. The book's greatest influence by far has been on the writing of fantasy literature itself. An enormous number of writers have found a niche in the market The Lord of the Rings opened up so dramatically. Stephen R. Donaldson, Terry Brooks, Tad Williams, and even a comic writer such as Terry Pratchett, to name only a handful, have all written novels that draw heavily on Tolkien's example in a variety of ways. Since The Lord of the Rings became such a success, Publishers have been quick to promote new authors as the next Tolkien, although with mixed results. Arising as it did out of an essentially personal and private vision that had been taking shape in its author's imagination for decades, The Lord of the Rings achieves effects that cannot be easily duplicated. Filling your story with elves, dwarves, and wizards will not by itself make you another Tolkien, though many have tried. Do you only have to go down to any of the bookshops and look on the shelves and you'll see um, huge fantasy sections. 
um, many of which really didn't, weren't, haven't been written in, until around about the 70s and onwards. Um, it's certainly, I think its size, its sheer scale that it covered made it profoundly influential in terms of creating worlds. I mean, there were other writers around. I don't think, I don't think it stood alone. I think it was in dialogue with other types of fantasy. You know, obviously there's, there's the C.S. Lewis fantasies. Um, there's, there's the science fantasy, the Heinleins and so on, um, also going on and, and written at the same time. And C.S. Lewis was writing science fantasy as well. Um, and you do, but you do find that the basic kind of worlds that it's constructed crop up over and over again. You find um, certain types, like the hobbits, cropping up. There's there are a lot. There's a lot of stealing. There's always cross fertilization. No, no book sort of sits in its sort of isolated little pocket and doesn't influence anything else. But because of the sheer scale of it, I think it it did generate a lot of um, a lot of copies and a lot of pastiches as well. Among its many readers, The Lord of the Rings has inspired tremendous devotion and affection. There are variously named Tolkien societies in countries around the world. If you search the internet using Tolkien's name, you'll generate something like 120,000 hits, many of them dedicated websites offering discussion groups, artwork, music, scholarly books and articles, and news of theatrical and film productions based on Tolkien's writings. Well, I think that he found certain aspects of the success, particularly the cult aspects and the extreme amount of publicity, very difficult, particularly as he was getting older by this time. Um, he was frightened of the intrusions on his privacy. He didn't like fame and he didn't like uh, all the palaver at all. He never actually really ever appreciated that he'd become famous, always wealthy. He. Um, always worried about his finances. The Lord of the Rings has attracted a dedicated and diverse body of readers. Its publishers continue to present it to the public in a bewildering number of formats, from inexpensive paperbacks to deluxe hardback editions, luxuriously bound and lavishly illustrated. Some of these almost resemble family Bibles. Fantasy and science fiction sections in bookshops often display a special range of shelves devoted to Tolkien's books. And there have been many published posthumously after The Lord of the Rings. As purely a publishing and marketing phenomenon then, The Lord of the Rings looks set to be with us for a very long time indeed. But what about its literary reputation? Many a wildly popular and successful author from the 19th century finds scarcely a single reader today. Does a similar fate await Tolkien's books? Or will their current popularity translate into the kind of reputation enjoyed by Moby Dick or War and Peace? Oh yeah, I think as a book, it'll endure as long as um, English is read. You know, fashions change, you can't say what people will read in a hundred years' time, but it's an influence that might carry on. I think it already is timeless. I, 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 there are very few pieces of literature that become, uh, that are timeless, and there's very few pieces of art, and very few pieces of music, um, but I think it's just sufficiently different and was written at such an important formative time for a lot of people like me. Um, I think that literature of that imagery and that, that kind is, is going to be timeless because there's nothing else like it. Well, let's face it, written Lord of the Rings written in sort of from 1938 onwards, published in 54, selling by the box load in 2001. Don't really think it's going to sort of suddenly drop out of favour or fashion. Manor Road, of course, everything is destroyed. I mean, Manor Road, which I lived in, is now being completely destroyed. There's an enormous uh, uh, combined English and law library built there, which isn't bad, I think, at all. Memories of, uh, again, so a lot of it inside is very good, isn't it? In there, amongst other things, which is connected, I suppose, with me, I suppose is a, a bronze bust to myself. Which has an interesting history. It was done by my daughter-in-law. Faith Falkenbridge Tolkien. And 
was exhibited in the it was, it was exhibited in the British Academy. There I was tearing down the. It was eventually presented to me uh, by the English faculty, but it's only, it was only a, a plaster cast, and so I used some of the ill-gotten gains of Lord of the Rings to have it cast in bronze. There's about only one firm that does it, and presented it at the end of my career too. Yeah, it's one of the fine most. Oh, we have a snap of it. 